This is Steve Pennington with Showstoppers Promotions, and you're listening to the business side of music. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender, and you're listening to this edition of the business side of music. On the show today, we have Gary Lux. Gary was introduced to me through a mutual friend of ours, Ken McMeans. You've heard in one of our previous podcasts, and uh, you're going to be hearing from him on an upcoming podcast that Gary's going to join us on. Gary's one of uh, Hollywood's premier music mixers with literally thousands of projects to his credit. He's an accomplished 5.1 surround mixer and has worked on many soundtracks for film and television, of which I've made a list here. Gary holds a sterling reputation within the industry for musical excellence and for accomplishing high-volume projects on time and within budget. Boy, that's surprising. We don't see that too often. That's a lot of pressure there. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Until forming his own successful independent recording company in 1988. You don't look that old. Uh, Gary was the head music mixer for Universal Studios. He has two Emmy Award nominations for his work with the Jacksons and Frank Sinatra. Albums include, are you ready? Rob Thomas was something to be, Janet Jackson, Usher, Ben Harper, and the Blind Boys of Alabama, Sting, Nora Jones, Keith Urban, Rod Stewart, Foo Fighters, one of my favorites, Britney Spears, No Doubt, Joey Ramone, Tears for Fears, Pancho Sanchez, another one of my faves, Styx, Widespread Panic, and Kobe Calais. Gary, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. Oh, good. And in our conversations before we started, it found out we're kind of brethren of a sort because you're a bass player. Yeah, and, yeah. And we're, I'm a bass player. And we got to share some history in our gear. We're the hip, hippest started. guys in the band. Yeah, the hippest guys in the band. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we were the serious musicians. Oh, of course. Of yeah. course, right. So how'd you get started? You know, I got started with music when I, when I was very young. Somehow when I'm four or five years old, I found myself just banging pots and pans And, you know, Bob, you know, like some people know that they're going to be doctors because they've been taking apart frogs their whole life or they know they're going to be lawyers, maybe because they've been lying their whole lives. (laughs) I've been a I've been a a music person, uh, you know, from the beginning of time and never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that it would manifest at this type of level. I I feel blessed and and, uh, grateful. For the things that I've done. How did you get into uh, the recording and mixing? I mean, that's, you know, some musicians seem to transfer that fairly easily. Was it for you? Well, it kind of was, and and I was lucky at that. I started, I I got a job as as a gopher at Evergreen Recording Studios in 1977. At the time, it was the old Magnolia Movie Theater in Burbank. It was purchased by the owners. The next week, they were knocking the studio, knocking the movie theater down, and uh, started building what became Evergreen Studios. So, did they take the actual structure of the theater? The down structure, or? no. The movie theater but stayed just the same. The they completely the gutted oh, the wow. inside, and then you know made a second floor and Studio A, Studio B, and all of the isolation areas. And it was. Uh, I had never seen anything like it, and I was the gopher, so I was running to get lunch, I'm running to get nails, I'm I'm doing anything. Typically what a gopher or production sure, assistant does starting absolutely. out. absolutely. Yeah. You know, green as can be, but I'm, I'm it. Well, you know, my son, he, I think he was 15 at the time, and he wanted to get into the recording business, and he interned at uh, Curb Recording Studios in Nashville, and I asked him at the end of his first week, how did it go, and he said, well, Pops, all I did was make coffee, get donuts, and roll up cables. And I said, welcome to the record business. And you know something? If you didn't do that well, because it's sort of a code of ethics with engineers on how they pass information on to onto younger guys, the younger guys certainly have to show a real uh, uh, initiative on, on wanting to be what they are so that they do get this information. Being a gopher at the time for me was going to college. It really was my college education. Yeah, and, and, it, and I've said this, Many times, uh, in fact, I have it on my Facebook page that I went to the University of Hard Knocks because yeah. you can go to uh, the Mike Curb 
uh, School of Music Business, or you can go to UCLA or USC where they have some prestigious music business programs. But getting in the trenches and actually, you know, rolling those cables and before you ever touch a button on the console or ever plug in a mic, there's just a lot of down to earth, gritty dirty things that you have to learn about the business sure there's a million things that can go wrong it's, it's and usually it, do and 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 you can count on it yeah and so it's 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 how you follow the path how you you know how you learn how to run the cables correctly and you know i always said if the if the studio looks lousy it's going to sound lousy and so you know as a as a gopher then becoming a stage hand and moving on to becoming an assistant uh i think the efficiency part was uh played a key role for me. I'm going to actually quote you on that. That's a great quote. If it looks lousy, it's going to sound yeah, lousy. Yeah, if it's it's uh, and I believe it. When I look at the cables and I see someone's going to trip or I'm I'm all about the musicians. I want their experience to be stellar. I I don't want them to have to stand on anything, electric cables and stuff. So I'm a stickler about that and that's really the way I feel. If it's if it looks lousy, it's going to sound lousy. What city did you start in? I actually, uh, even though I I came directly from college in the Midwest, I came to Los Angeles and I started here. And you know, in in my gopher in my gopher how'd profession. You up, how'd you wind up at Universal? After I was at Evergreen for six years, I had. Uh, I, well, I was a stagehand. Then I became an assistant engineer, assisting well over 120 mixers in my very short assistant career. Universal Studios in 1985, 84, um, closed their scoring stage and they rebuilt it, modernized it, and all the shows from Universal came over to Evergreen and I mixed them. And so once they opened up Universal again, right. all the composers asked, they said, we want to bring Gary back to Universal. And that was uh, that was quite an opportunity. <laughs> and you got to work with some amazing artists. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, well, at the Universal thing, you know, you know, kid from Brooklyn makes good in Hollywood. You know, the first day I went through the arches of Universal, I'm, I really, I pinched myself, you know, from the road that I had traveled to the short amount of time that I was a gopher and all the thousands of sessions that I had assistant, assisted on and worked on to have gotten the head scoring mixer position was something I didn't take lightly. What was your first uh, film you worked on or TV show? You know, I did a lot of work for Mike Post and Pete Carpenter, so I did a Some lot of the, I did a lot of the Hill Street Blues, Wise Guy Hunter, wow. L.A. Laws, uh, Magnums, uh, uh, and back in the Evergreen days, it was uh, uh, Ten Speed and Brown Shoe and the White Shadow, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so I I did a lot of things uh, with Mike Post. Became very good friends with him. Played a lot of golf with him. So uh, that's where he was doing you know the Universal shows and. Uh, that's what I did first. And, and he was a great composer. I mean, his music still, you hear it all oh, the time. He's you recognize it, you know what show. As soon on. as he play, you know, two or three bars, you you know it's it's his music. And we became very good friends and we played a lot of golf and through the years he a real mentor to me and a real confidant and uh and for someone that it was hard to get close to at that time because Mike Post was the great Mike Post. A lot of people patronized him at the right. time. Not me. I treated him like, and he loved it. And, he, and that's something I want to bring up. Don't, don't you find it, we need to be careful how we treat these people because you're right. So many folks out there patronize them, and they're just regular guys you know, like us. I, you know, when, when you're a mixer, you're an engineer, and you're meeting someone for the first time, like a Michael Jackson when I met him the, the first time. I think the most important thing, because I've worked with so many, the most important thing that I do is I, I get a second with them alone. Hello, how are you? And I just let them know that uh, I'm there for them and try to make it as easy as possible. I'm not asking for autographs. I'm not asking for any. We just, we've got work to do, and I just want to make them feel comfortable as soon as possible. And we're all working to accomplish the same thing anyway, which sure. is this project. Uh, you know, I, I've shared the story in the past where Brian Wilson was in the studio recording with uh, with a bass player. They were doing a session, and, and the bass player just wasn't getting the track. The session player wasn't getting the track right. And Brian Wilson kept having him do it over and over and over, and the bass player finally asked. And, you know, basically the, the cusp of the story is Brian Wilson said, well, 100 years from now, that bass note's still going to be out there. 
you know, is that what you really want people to hear? And of course, the bass player went back and, and tracked it the way it needed to be done. Because what we do accomplish in the studio is something that's out there in in the solar system for infinity, for all times. Yeah, and yeah. You, you got to get it right. I think that's the part that really excites me the most about really what it is I, that I do is how many people hear it, how many people are affected by it. And, you know, every project that I take, I, I make it my own. So it becomes my legacy too. Whether it was Barry Manilow or it was Aaron Neville, you know, the songs that, you know, that I've mixed for so many, they become my own, Yeah, you know. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I want to go a little further into some of the projects you did. And then we're going to talk about part of what brought us here, which is the Stereo Chickens sure. and your new project. But we'll come back to that. This is Bob Bender. We're in the studio with Gary Lux, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Vinny Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. Side of music. This is Bob Bender. You're listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music. In the studio with us today, Gary Lux, which, by the way, I want to say what a cool studio. We, we typically don't go out on location too much, but when we heard about your facility here, I said, all right, we're, we're going to do this. So uh, it's very cool. Thank you for having us in here today. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in case some of the cables don't work, I, I have plenty more. Yeah, and microphones. <laughs> and microphones and yeah. other things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were talking during the break about how some of the things that you have done, some of the people you have worked with, and not necessarily the stars, but the production assistants, the, the assistant engineers, how you touch their lives. And, and I think that's one thing that we have to keep in perspective in our industry is good, bad, or indifferent. What is the lasting impression we're going to make on people? And I think that's important when you go into the studio and work like you do. And, and you know, your credentials speak volumes because I love it when you can say as a statement of fact that, you know, we're going to do this on time or we're going to do it within budget and it's going to sound yeah. great. In the record business especially, that can be very difficult to open. Sure, yeah. You know, I mean, coming from the foundation of maybe film and television, although I did tons of records and and, and jingles as well. But, uh, you know, you are on a, are on a budget uh, when you're doing uh, orchestras and, you you know, and the room is probably going for fifteen twenty thousand $20,000 a day with all the players that are in there. Uh, you got to move, and you have to move quickly, and, and you have to be expedient and, about and, it, and, and get it right the first time. And you have to, and you have to get it right. So, but that goes with the reason why I'm so early to everything in my life. You know, engineers were the first ones there and yeah. last ones to leave. Right. So I'd much rather be at a session drinking coffee for a half hour, forty five minutes knowing that all the mics are up, everything's set, and everything's perfect, even though curveballs are coming. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to worry about it. Looking at your list of artists that you worked with, you know, one that has always intrigued me, a huge fan, was Sinatra. And, of course, yeah. you know, this is a guy who went into the studio, I, I'm going to assume, in Capitol Records, where he did most of his. Yeah. And and he'd be there for the sessions. And, of course, back then, you know, he had a live orchestra. It wasn't, there was no... Uh, MIDI tracks or anything else. It was, you know, whatever it was, 40, 50, 60 pieces. Um, have you had the opportunity to work in situations like that? Well, with him, yeah. uh, I, I actually had some a couple of very funny stories. Lee Hirschberg at the time was the, was the engineer, and I was assisting Lee Hirschberg. I probably spent eight hours setting up the studio, putting Frank in the middle of the room, surrounding him with the saxes, wow. the drums, everything was yeah. all set up. It was perfect. I was so proud. And again, for all the artists that I've worked with, and I, you know, I'm mesmerized, and, you know, but I do it in my own 
personal way. I don't get all excited. When Frank walked in the room, truly the waters parted. <laughs> he he was there and, you know, hiya guys and everyone's, Frank, how are you? And everything's great like this. So we get to the, um, we get this, you know, he gets, and he sees everybody in the band and he gets in front of the microphone. He goes, okay, guys, let's kick it off. A one, two. A one, two, three, ba ba intro, bang, 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 he starts, go, and he goes, and when I, <coughs> hold on a second, hold on a second, let's go, all right, let's take it again, take it again, he goes, a one, a two, a one, two, three, and when I meet bad, whatever he was going to say, <coughs> and he go, you know what, guys, I don't feel it tonight, let's go for dinner, and out the door he went. He was in he was in the building for twenty six <laughs> minutes. He tried two takes, didn't feel it, and and I'm going, I'm like, but I just set up the eight whole, hours. Yeah. Hey. So that was you know one funny Frank story, but the others what I'm very proud of, and I was nominated for an Emmy Award for the uh, Frank Sinatra Eighty Years My Way TV special. So which we did is, do vocals with him, yeah, which was what a great project, which was uh, you know an honor to work on, and so uh, you know that was like uh, the ninth inning you know for for Frank in his career, of yeah. course, but uh, but he went out with a home run, if you uh, ask legendary me. nonetheless. Yeah. I was honored to have le gotten to be in the same room with him for three times. So what was it like to transition from Frank Sinatra to, say, the Foo Fighters, or No Doubt? Yeah, well, those... It, the, the There's obviously a time span in there. You well, know. there are, sure, many years and many projects and things, but a lot of the... with. The Foo Fighters and Sting and the Aaron Neville's and and uh, Britney Spears stuff, that was a lot of uh, 5.1 mixes back in the in the days when DVD audio and Super Audio CD were starting to come to pass. We would get the original multi tracks. You know, everyone knows it as a stereo two track mix, but it was my responsibility to mix it in surround sound because we put the stereo mix and the surround sound mix on the DVDs. And so here I am mixing an internationally acclaimed mix like uh, uh, Usher's 8701, the complete album. So I would- And you're mixing it into 5.1. And I'm mixing it in 5.1. So I took the two-track mix and I put it into my, my workstation. And so I'm constantly bouncing back and forth, listening to the record, to my mix, to record, to my mix. And a lot of the events that would happen that people recognize going left to right or right to left or some of the events that were happening, I honored because I didn't want to do something different than that. My job was just to make it bigger, wider, huger, and 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 eventually, after I stopped referencing, I made it my own. And so I got to mix quite a bit of things, you know, in, in surround sound. How, how did you learn to... Mix in 5.1. Well, it was, it, it, you know, everything in the beginning is trial and error. Um, in the beginning days when I worked for a company called 5.1 Entertainment, oddly enough, yeah. 5.1 Surround, we were getting tracks in and we were not getting exactly blue chip things to work on. And then one of the turning points for the company was that the company signed Gordon Goodwin in the Big Fat Band. And they're, you know, arguably one of the greatest big bands, you know, in contemporary times. So I mixed three of their first albums in surround, although Tommy Vicari recorded it and mixed it in, in stereo. I got the tracks and I mixed it in 5.1, those three albums, along with two Aaron Neville albums. And at the beginning of 5.1 uh, surround st stuff, I would go to the AES shows or the NAM shows and all of my mixes were playing everywhere because there wasn't that much content yeah, wow. in that format at that time. And then once I mixed uh, Sting's Brand New Day concert, you know, things started to really roll and I, I, I did, did a tune for the Bee Gees. And, and now I'm getting the original multi-tracks. Of course, we transferred it to, you know, Pro Tools. Right. But to hear, uh, you know, it was, it was incredible to work on these things. That's amazing. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I uh, want to get your, your take on advice on what to offer the aspiring engineer or producer, because that's one, one, that's one question we always want to ask. Mm. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Stereo Chickens project, which, you know, I got to tell you, 
it blew my socks off. It's real cool. Ah, thanks so much. This is Bob Bender. We're in the studio with Gary Lux, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Next up, the Indie Artist Spotlight, brought to you by Reverb Nation. Hi, y'all. My name is Brendan Young, and I am a proud member of Reverb Nation. She's the feeling of a lazy summer evening. When you think of love, well, she's the meaning, she's the magic of, of the moon and stars. I am originally from Aniana, Alabama, and currently live in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. She's the simple life like the days of old. She's the feeling stirring deep inside my soul when I, oh, when I strum the soul guitar. Growing up, my musical influences as far as genres go were things like folk and bluegrass and old southern gospel hymns. As far as artists go, people like George Strait and Josh Turner were great influences on my style and the way that I sing and the way that I write. Over the past few years, I've greatly enjoyed uh, all the opportunities that I've gotten to play at smaller venues, uh, such as restaurant venues, all over the state of Alabama and even in some neighboring states, and playing some small festivals here and there. But then this past summer, I got the opportunity to go to Branson, Missouri, and be a featured performer in a show that was a country rock show on the showboat Branson Bell. So that was an incredible opportunity, and I, I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, here recently, my band and I got to open for James LeBlanc, who is a legendary singer-songwriter from right here in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And then the next day, we turned right around and went and played a car show down in my old hometown of Aniana, Alabama. That all of this started with hello. I am currently working on a CD project here in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. And I would love to share with you my brand new studio release of one of my original songs called Without You. Love is made brand new I can't stand being 
so far away, so far apart. My love, you have my future, my everything, my heart. Every time I think about you, my heart skips a beat, and I get to wishing that you. Every time I think about you, my heart skips a beat, and I can't wish that you were lying here with me. Once again, my name is Brendan Young, and I'm a proud member of Reverb Nation. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender. You're listening to this edition of the business side of music. We're in the studio with Gary Lux. I wish you listeners could hear some of the conversations we're having during the breaks because we it's a wealth of information that's <laughs> passing around this room. So let's get on to let's let's move from Frank Sinatra and No Doubt and Air Neville to the Stereo Chickens. Yeah. How'd you come across these guys? Well, I uh, I became very good friends with uh, Ken McMeans, uh, the leader of the group. Um, I actually met him uh, at a at the Orange County Fair where I was producing a, a, an artist and we were already on the road. I met him at the fair. You know, he, he really liked the band and asked me if I had done any other work in the music business. And I said, no, I just, you and, know. And I, you I, hadn't told him who you were. Oh, no, no, I, no, no, no. I, 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 it just, I was mixing the the band, you know, I'm here at the Orange County Fair, which I laugh at sometimes because I've been in the studio with so many. So I'm, here I am at the Orange County Fair. Anyway, well, you're only as good as your next gig. The, a, a, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. So. I, I met Ken, who had introduced me as a, he was an agent, and he told me that he was a songwriter, and he did a lot of work in television, and he did a lot of this. And I said, you know, it's really nice to meet you. And I gave him my card, and then he came back the next day, and he was just, you know, he came and says, that was not fair. You didn't tell me all the things that you've done, and I feel like an idiot, and uh, thank you very much for all of that. And we became very good friends. Ultimately, he ended up booking um, um, the group that I, I, I was producing, and uh, because of his uh, infectious personality, we had stayed in touch, and we became really good friends. And he had told me at the time, this is fast forwarding now, that the group um, that he had started, Stereo Chickens, um, was looking to cut some tracks. They thought they were going to go to Austin and 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 cut it there for some sort of vibe. And then I said, oh, great, well, you know, who's going to mix it? And he says, uh, you are. And I said, oh, okay, that's, what, that's great. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, you know, we're serious about doing this. And, uh, you know, who's going to produce it? And we want you to do it now <laughs> so we've uh, we had meetings of the mind and um we talked about things and of course uh, we listened to a, a bunch of songs that were candidates to to um to record first right um and we came upon uh 
the three songs, Crazy Fool, um, Brothers in Arms. Brothers in Arms. One of the, yeah. his Brothers in Arms, Crazy Fool, and uh, Great Big Sky. Three really beautiful songs, three different kind of songs, because if you're going to kind of do a little bit of an EP, you got to have at least three songs. It's always great to have five, three songs. So one song does this, one song does that, and the other doesn't pigeonhole you into song one or two. It shows a diversity. So we picked out some songs and uh, and move forward. I want, to, I want to sidebar for a minute before we get back with that. Is is, is that something you would you would suggest to most artists that are working on on an EP is to really come with three unique pieces of material? I mean, because they there still has to be an identifying factor there or, or identifying quote, uh, quotient of who they are. You know, what are they looking for now these days? What are, well, what it's, are, it's what are interesting. people listening for? I, I kind of put the onus on the group that I'm about to produce because they have to have a sense of, in, in the business world, what are they up against? Because this isn't this isn't cheap of what we do. It no. takes a lot of time and and, and it can be expensive, um, and, and you put a lot of effort into it. So I'll typically ask a group, you know, how many songs have you written? And they go, we, oh, we got twenty songs. And they'll say, uh, and I'll ask, how many of them do you think are hits? And they say, you know, well, we don't know. And I said, well, that's not a really good answer. Yeah. I said because you're a business person. You know, this or should we're not, be a we're not flying by the seat of our pants here. You have to. And who is your competition? Who who would you say out there you don't not sound like, but you know who who's taken the the the, the, the share of the pie right. in that genre that you're in? So I always kind of turn it around and ask them to have a sense of what they were trying to accomplish. So out of the as many songs as I can hear in a demo mode, I'll hear them. I always ask the artist to come in. I'll record them down and dirty. Just play, play me so that when they're gone, I can reflect on the songs as many as there are. And then help justify why we should put the resources into song one song two or song three and i generally tell them there's no reason to talk about song five and song six at this time because if song one and two hasn't done it for you five and six are not going to help you do you suggest that they in their minds i mean yeah okay they've done 20 songs but in their minds they've got to know that you know song seven eight nine is better than four five six they should absolutely pitch you the best that they've got. Well, that's that's interesting that you ask. So I said, okay, I'm the president of, uh, you know, Universal Nashville, and I've got five minutes that I've given you of your time. And so what is what do you want me to know about you? What yeah, is your it. best it, impression? Yeah. Yeah. Give me the three songs. I get, get right to it. Don't need to hear the whole songs. And I got five minutes, and, and that's all I've got. What it, how do you want to be remembered? Yeah, and so it's it, it's sometimes it really throws people off as to looking into the mirror because you know this isn't easy of what we do here. You know, it's it, it is easy to go through the motion of what we do, and it's difficult to be great, and it's even more difficult to become undeniable, which is really what I'm looking for. And there's a ton of great, great competition out great, there you know that great you're up against there. every day yeah and so i'm looking to find out a can i can i fulfill the mandate of what this group really needs to be done and and then i give them my suggestions and my take on things talk things down maybe play some other songs that i'm trying to reference on how i think i'd like to approach things and really get them involved in you know really looking in the mirror of uh, for something that they may not have done before. I, I think with the stereo chickens too, the the harmonies that they bring to the game is something you just don't hear a lot of. Well, they 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 are unique within themselves, and typically a group is you know the sum of the parts, and it's that interaction and how they how they how they blend together that that makes their sound. Although Ken McMeans has the John Mellencamp kind of raspiness and a real personality that, an imperfection, as it were, that people can really relate to. Yeah. Cynthia sings like a like a, a nightingale, and she really sings like a bird. And Tom's musicianship within the group really stands, you know, stands out, and his voice also 
is very emblematic and uh together you know they it's you know it's kind of fun it's kind of interesting i think their music's going to definitely be something great to listen to when it gets out there one last thing before we wrap it up if you had to give one piece of advice (laughs) to an aspiring engineer producer mixer someone within the music business wanting to young and fresh just got out of school ready to get their feet wet what would it be yeah you know it's a it is a tough question you know it's like asking me which plug-in that i would put in on a vocal that makes that vocal sound like this this is really difficult to what we do and it's very cliche what my answer could be it doesn't matter whether you want to be in the music business or you want to be in any business hopefully to god you love what you do and are willing to put the time in to become the best that you can be the music business is difficult it's very saturated there are many engineers the tools are uh, you know there's a plethora of tools that allow people to be producers now but within those tools it's made mediocrity malignant uh-huh. and and for me so you true. know i do love the tools but i i i still consider myself a painter and every time i move a fader it's i'm i'm painting with with brush strokes and that's just something that i've had in me and i that's the loving part so to to really answer the question I, you know when i first started bob it was it was 90 hour weeks in the studio and I got paid $151.04. I can't f- ever forget that number. <laughs> you can have as many hours as you want, you're getting $151.04. But I was in there day and night rolling tape in the studios, bringing bands in on the weekends, being ready to set up again for Monday and um, very lucky that we had a, a manager at Evergreen that was a forward thinking and wanted us to touch everything and do everything. Um, you gotta be great. You got to want it. You got to love it. It's tough. Yeah. And I think that's you just whittled it down to, to a nutshell. You got to love this. If, if you're doing it for any other reason, we've talked about this in other episodes, uh, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Do it because it's a passion. Yeah. And hopefully you can make money doing it and then you really hit yeah. it out of the park. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Gary, how can our listeners find you? Well, my website is garyluxmusic.com. And I can be reached by email at uh, GaryLux at me.com. Gary, thanks for being on the show. Bob, Appreciate thank you so much. It's this, a real pleasure. This has been a blast. If you're interested in learning more about our show, drop us a line at musicpodcast at mail.com. That's musicpodcast at M-A-I-L dot com. If you have any suggestions of persons or topics that involve some facet of the music industry that you'd like to hear about on our podcast, please feel free to let us know. You can follow us on Facebook on the Business Side of Music podcast page. You can also find us on Twitter at Music Business Podcast. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on iTunes, post a review on what you think of our show. This is Bob Bender, and you've been listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender for Bob Bender Productions. Co-producer for the show is Vinny Rebus. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.